Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It is such a joy to be gathered as God's people, even across the internet. I'm so glad that you're a part of this worship service today, for this is the public witness of First Presbyterian Church in Lafayette, Louisiana. And by watching it online, by joining us in this way, you are a part of that public witness. We have chosen at this time to worship online uh, for a little bit longer while we're waiting for the numbers to come down and for uh, the community to become a little safer during uh, a time of pandemic. This is also a time in which we're recovering in our region from a big storm that came through, Hurricane Laura, as many of you know. Those who are from out of town who are watching uh, know that we will let you know as soon as possible if there are ways to contribute and ways to help uh, as people always are so generous and uh, we're so thankful for it. Our congregation in the past has opened up as a PDA, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance uh, work site. We have a great partner in town, uh, but all of the damage is to the west of us, so I don't know if we'll be called on for that. Again, we'll let you know if there are opportunities to be in ministry and partnership with us as we look to this region and see what is it that we might do in response to God's love. Right now, we're all going to worship God together. Here, now, together. Let us worship the Lord. Join me in prayer. Gracious, holy, loving God, in our times of trial, when brokenness leaves us not knowing what else to do, we turn to you. In times of joy, when our hearts are so full that we don't know what else to do, we turn to you. As we turn to you this day, there is destruction all around. And some of us are asking, how much more can we bear? Yet we know that even before we're aware of our needs, you have sent others to bear them with us. Even as we cry out, we know that you are calling out to us to remember your grace and mercy from the past and to give thanks for the opportunities of the day that allow us to demonstrate your love and your mercy here and now. We start out at the font of your grace and mercy. We start with confession of sins, confession of the sins of the world in which we are a part. Forgive, O oh Lord, our silence and complicity in the sins of the past. Help us to root out the causes of injustice and pain with all the force of a hurricane, but with the gentleness of a mother hen gathering her brood. Let us be honest about the disasters that we cause or contribute to. Let us be faithful in responding to the ones that we can't avoid. And let us be filled with joy, even if only in the hope that we have in you. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, who is the Christ. Amen. Winds may blow, rain may pour, but this water restores life in all its fullness. Hear these waters as they call you by name, for you are God's beloved, and the waters of baptism remind us of God's never-failing love, not just for you or for me, but for everyone everywhere. May the life-creating power of God create newness of life in you and in me this day. For I declare to you, we have been set free from sin and death by the grace and mercy of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Place the new 
streaming, now as the darkness vanished away, seeing the space of fears and our dreamings, brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken, gather us in the blind and the lame, call to us now and we shall awaken, we shall arise at the sound of our name. comes to us from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Listen now for what these words are saying to us today, to the church. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coal on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's reading is so full of beauty and grace that it's like pulling up a chair to an all-you-can-eat buffet. Rather than trying to get it all on your plate at once, I'm going to encourage you to read it again and again and again and just let it all sink in. For our conversation today, There are two words that I want to focus on and two images that I want to share with you. The words I want to lift up are genuine and haughty. H-A-U-G-H-T-Y. This is not to be confused with the term genuine haughty, which is probably so old that no one says it anymore, and you can probably hear my children rolling their eyes and laughing at me from miles away even as I record this. Anyway, a genuine haughty is or was someone who is legitimately attractive. Back in the dark ages of social media, it was not uncommon for someone to try to curate or cultivate images that made others think that they were perfectly posed and professionally lit, even while napping. And in some ways, that hasn't really changed. It may have even gotten worse as people talk about their own personal brands. I want you to keep all that in mind, though, as we talk more about what Paul had to say to the church in Rome. It's important to remember that our reading is the the punchline. It's the crescendo of a larger argument about God's grace and mercy. It's important to note that what Paul is talking about 
is a response to the grace and mercy of God. For once you know of God's love, everything flows from it, like water moving from snow-capped peak to the, to the flow of a coursing river. Everything is either an affirmation of or rejection of the love that loves for the sake of loving. Now in the NRSV, that's what we normally go to in the Presbyterian Church, in the NRSV, Paul says to let love be genuine. Other translations say let lo- that love must be sincere and that it must be shown without pretending. You can't love and pretend to love at the same time. You can't pretend to be loving and be loving. Well, already you can see how this might be problematic if your goal is to be a genuine hottie, which is a pretending thing. But maybe we can think about this a little differently. Maybe the attractive thing about following Jesus has nothing to do with looks, at least not in the traditional sense, not on the surface. Maybe it has more to do with looking inside first and connecting what we do with who we are as God's people. That's where the next use of the word haughty comes in. The NIV says, do not be proud. This is H-A-U-G-H-T-Y, by the way. Do not be proud. The CEB, the Common English Bible, says, consider everyone as an equal, and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Pretty much every version goes on to say some version of, we should associate with those who have no status in the world. But I really like the way the Common English Bible follows it with, don't think you're so smart. In other words, maybe you know some stuff, but knowing and loving aren't the same thing. Knowing and being and doing are often wildly apart from one another. And what matters most, according to Paul, is whether or not we can be welcoming. Hospitality, particularly to those who can't repay, is the embodiment of grace and mercy. Being welcoming to strangers is the way that love becomes real. Now, our congregation has learned a lot over the past few years about the importance of being welcoming, particularly after a disaster like a flood or a hurricane. And as I said earlier, and God willing, we will welcome more volunteers as our region recovers once more. The thing is, storms always come that may also become worse depending on how we care for our environment. The same can be said about conflicts over politics, tensions with ethnicity, and fair treatment. All of it can boil out of control if all we ever do is respond with self-centeredness and violence. Like, we're the ones who have the answers, and those who are like us are the only ones who are wounded. But I have to say, When a black man with a knife gets shot in the back, we're all wounded. When a white teenager is driven by his mom to a protest across state where he can shoot people with a gun that he shouldn't have access to in the first place, we're all wounded. When a middle-aged white couple feels so threatened that they believe they must point loaded guns and possibly kill someone to be able to protect themselves, When we're in that situation, we're all wounded. We all need to find a way to heal these wounds together without creating more wounds to share. Now, it may sound silly to you, but the first time I learned about nonviolence and responding to evil with love was not in seminary. It was in the fourth grade. Mrs. Bridges pulled me into the hall for a private consultation because I was being disruptive in class. She was kind but stern, and I had no idea what was coming, and I was terrified. But I'll never forget what I got. She said, I don't understand it. I know your mom. I know you come from a good Christian home. You have nice clothes. I can tell that you're taken care of. Why are you acting like this? Well, I kind of stammered something about being picked on. And she said, next time you let me worry about them, you can tell me. Just remember this. 
The Bible says that if you will be nice to people who are mean to you, this is right out of our reading today, if you'll be nice to people who are mean to you, it's like pouring hot coals on their heads. Might have been a little bit much for a fourth grader, but I can tell you it stuck with me. It stuck with me to know that kindness is more effective than punching someone in the face, no matter how much you might want to. It stuck with me to know that Christians can help each other and that the Bible matters. And knowing what it says is way better than just knowing how to read it or even just where things are. I don't really remember anything else that happened in that class, <laughs> but I don't remember having any enemies in that class either. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm so naive to think that there aren't some people in situations that can only be deterred by violence. Christian academics call this the just war theory, and the fallback illustration is, of course, Nazi Germany. It was good and important that men and women of faith stood up to the fascist policies and the oppressive violence of Nazi Germany. It, it had to be done. Yet these people, these Nazis, were not monsters. At, at least not all of them, and maybe some of them were. But let me show you an image. This is the first image I wanted to share. This is a photo of staff members from Auschwitz, the infamous Nazi death camp where thousands of Jews were systematically murdered. Some might say that their cheerful disposition is the very face of evil. How could people do these things and smile and look that happy about it? Yet these are human beings who think they're doing the right thing. They may even be baptized Christians. They're so full of the belief that they are in the right, that the pain and suffering of others does not matter to them. I guarantee you that none of them woke up that morning and said, let's personify evil. Yet their indifference is what gave permission to one of the greatest evils we've known. Now, I'm not sharing this image to make the slippery slope argument, you know that one, right? But I'm also not denying the possibility that our indifference, our expectation that we're the ones that are building truth condos on the Monopoly board, our expectation that we're in the right, because how else could we be, that creates more space for evil to move in. And it's true that previous generations made unbelievable sacrifices to stop greater evils from taking place. But nations still go to war, and Nazis and others like them still promote themselves in ways that divide and dehumanize others, and not just in Germany. The hard truth is that we are still called to love. We are called to expect that love might change hearts that are genuinely haughty into hearts that are genuine hotties who attract with their love and joy. Maybe you'd like to see one of those to clarify what I mean by that, what I think of as a genuine hottie. Well, here's someone that I would call a genuine hottie. Life goals right here. This is Mitch. All I know is that he usually plays his guitar at a coffee shop in Lake Charles called Stellar Beans. This picture was taken the day after Hurricane Laura blew through town. And I have no idea what he's singing or what he thinks, feels, or believes. But I believe this is an image that describes what Paul is talking about to the church in Rome. In the aftermath of destruction, we proclaim God's love. When everything is broken, we proclaim God's love. There's no way to fake it. There's no way to sit still while you're doing it. And just like the image of Mitch the Guitar Man in this picture, the presence of love transforms everything from longing to hope to spaces of hospitality and peace. At least I pray that it may be so with me and that it may be so with you. And to God be the glory, now and always. Amen. Sun.
Friends, let's join our hearts and minds together in prayer. I'm going to offer up some petitions, some topics, things to pray about, and encourage you to spend a little bit of time in prayer with me. And then also uh, we can all say, O oh Lord, hear our prayer together, if you like. Let's pray. Gracious God, with hearts filled with joy from the knowledge of your love for us, we lift up every good and wonderful thing that we've experienced this week. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Even as we rejoice in the experience of your peace in the midst of storms that rage, hear us as we lift up places of conflict in our lives. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Hear us as we pray for friends and family who have been harmed by the recent hurricane and help them to know that they are yet beloved by you. O Lord, hear our prayer. Hear us as we call out against the storms of racism and self-centeredness, reactive violence and suffering. O Lord, hear our prayer. Hear us now as we pray in the name in the way of Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Beloved of God, Scripture reminds us to be loving and kind because we need to be reminded of it. We need to be reminded that without loving kindness, without empathy, and without humility, we cut ourselves off from experiencing God's grace. To so go now to experience the loving kindness of God, even as you seek to express it. And as you do, may the love of God enfold you. May the peace of Christ hold you. May the Spirit of God embolden you, now and always. Amen. Amen.